Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Kruger, and in studio with us tonight, Mr. Mr. Anthony Prohaska of Cover One's Disguised Coverage podcast. I'm shocked we could get you. You know, you're such a big timer now. You know, you have Mina Kimes on, you, mm. you're rubbing elbows with legitimate TV personnel. Like, what? I, I, thank you for making time for the little people. Well, you're. Your agent knows my agent, and you guys go way back, so I think, like, it was just right for me to kind of grace you guys with my presence. I should probably, <laughs> no, I love being here. We, I, I don't know how many times we've even done stuff together. Um, I tell you all the time, like, any anytime you want me, you got me. I love coming here. I love the studio and the setup and the drinks, and plus, honestly, like, just being here... MJF and Will Ospreay this past week on Dynamite, such a crazy match. I know you got thoughts. I know we'll get into it in this episode. Like, it's just everything just lines up so well. well. Here's what I love. What I love is that some people think that the wrestling jokes and the stuff that we do is is funny, and some people hate it. And what those some, people some need do. to know is that there's so much more of it coming now. Yeah. You just shouldn't voice those things. You should leave them alone, because if I'm anything, I'm an antagonist. Just ask any of my three brothers. So <laughs> it was funny. I have to bring this up. It's especially relevant right now today. I had sent him a few days ago when word broke that Hulk Hogan was going to be making an appearance at the Republican National Convention. Mm. I sent him the clip. It was a tweet. And it was the clip of Booker T. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it because I'm not describing it. Booker T having one of the most famous on-air flubs of his career. And somebody captioned it with, the Democratic National Convention has the chance to do the funniest thing ever. And they could just bring in Booker T for a spot. Now, with that said, it's a, it's especially funny because it's wrestling centric and it has to do with politics, and that's all everybody wants. Like, it's all anybody wants to talk about these days: wrestling and politics, right? Yeah. More so, more so politics than the wrestling. <laughs> Today, there was a hilarious tweet. Wolf Blitzer is sitting down in the, I think it was the El Presidente, like there's a bar or cafe in downtown DC. And he tweeted out a picture of himself drinking the Wolf Spritzer. They made a drink for him. That's super funny. That's and he awesome. went there to go enjoy himself. It's yeah. the middle of the day on a Sunday. I'm going to have a good time. And then two hours later, somebody's captioning it with a photo of him looking like making crazy eyes on CNN as he's announcing that Joe Biden has, has dropped out of the I presidential race. That's super funny. And it's funny because you have to think about, take all the politics and all the bullshit out of this. Here's a guy who's sitting down enjoying a cocktail named, like his namesake cocktail. Yeah. And he's enjoying this thing. And then he gets a phone call and they're like, we need you, you here. You gotta come into work. Now. And he goes, but guys, cocktail and they're like we don't care i've had like 17 wolf spritzers i've had five wolf spritzers they were like, we don't care can you sit upright okay then get your ass in here so he's in a suit and tie again on camera with the craziest Wax. eyes and it's it was like something out of an adam gase uh press conference oh nice or a joe biden press conference damn it if he has wandering eyes and it just made me laugh so hard because again That's if you throw funny. all the politics out the window this is the type of stuff that makes life funny where you're like this is a guy who's just trying to enjoy his sunday yeah he's just trying to chill and have no. to, I, I also like the idea of like the person on the phone being like no it doesn't matter you gotta wait what's a wolf spritzer never mind we don't have time you gotta you gotta <laughs> get in there's no time <laughs> yeah. for this i need you here now and he's like all right well i need that in writing because i'm getting so strong call me a car that's how this is going Guys, the the world can descend into chaos all it wants. I don't care. I'm here. Like I said, this is escapism. We come here for football and cocktails. Anthony. Cheers. Awesome day to have you. Awesome day for me to be imbibing this nonsense that you've parked in front of me. He knows I hate garnish, people. <laughs> and so this is what he does to me. Who hates garnish? There are, well, what all is sticking out of this glass, first of all? Uh, that is a, obviously, pineapple fronds. Uh, you have, uh, and then a uh, wheel of lemon, orange, and uh, grapefruit. <laughs> That's what's in there. I don't even think all that citrus goes well together. I don't know what this is, but bottoms up. Mm. 
now, like all of the oh, citrus I forward cocktails it. you make, this is very, very drinkable. It's like great. I was just floating around in a pool with cocktails earlier this afternoon. This would have gone real well. This is a banger. With me shirtless floating on an inner tube. What is this? Uh, again, to my template I said last week, you shoot for four ounces, ounce and a half of rums, ounce and a half of juice, ounce of liqueurs, bar spoon of simple syrup, and then whatever bitters you want to put. I use Barba- uh, three quarters Barbados rum, three quarters of a gold rum, mm-hmm. three quarters ounce of grapefruit juice, three quarters ounce of lime juice, uh, half ounce of maraschino liqueur, half ounce of velvet falernum. Sprinkle from a Cheetos puff. Or- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> orange, orange and Angostura bitters. There's and so, so there's no... There's nothing. To, there's nothing with pineapple in there, so I just put the fronds in there because you hate them. And then there's no lemon in there, so that's why there's a piece of lemon in there. And then Anthony, you got. Uh, I've never made it for you. It's your favorite drink, a whiskey sour. There you go. It, this is up there. This is fantastic. I'm very pleased. All right, so guys, we're here. Rookies have already reported for training camp. Players are going to report tomorrow or two days from now. <clears throat> if you're listening to this podcast the day it airs, it'll probably be about 24 hours after you hear this. It's time, and it feels good. Like I'm not going to say I've been mailing it in, but there's so <laughs> little. No, <laughs> I love the reaction from him. He goes, oh, my God. I'm not going to say I've been mailing it in, guys, but do you know after nine years of doing this stuff, it is incredibly hard to act like I care about so much of these off-season storylines. You've been in this. Tell me I'm wrong. No, yeah, it's 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 the dead time of like the season, the off season. You're trying to find stuff to do. I, that's why I I go backwards, and I'm breaking down film in episodes on guys from the 2023 season because there's only so many. Like, is Keon Coleman going to be the fit? Like, do the Bills miss Stephon Diggs? Like, <laughs> I'm going to talk about it, and so are 17 other shows this week. And it's like, okay, there's like there's just nothing to talk about and nothing to do. And I just don't want to talk about half of it because half of it I think is stupid. I think. Chris, can you give me my single? I don't mean to insult anybody, but what I'm about to say is highly insulting. I mean, that's the way that works, right? When you say, with all due respect, whatever's about to come out of your mouth... I said, with all due respect... ...is gonna make somebody upset. With all due respect, most of the things that we spend our summer talking about in terms of football is just bullshit. It's all conjecture that means nothing... And at the same time, probably won't have a major impact on the team when actual games start getting played. After the draft ends, you know who's on your roster. Sure, there's some fun conversation and there's some postulation you can do. But then once you go too far and you hit like mid-June to early July, I don't care who you are. If you're still taking this seriously, you sound like every WGR caller who just doesn't understand that you're not the show. Mm. Your job is to call in, give somebody a point to chew on, and get the hell out. Mm. Chris, you, you hate callers, right? Yes. When I asked Chris about this show, I go, we should be, we should take calls from listeners. He shot that idea down like, like it was the Battle of Midway, and I had a big red dot oh. on the side of my plane. He shot that thing down. They have good ones. And it was, but it's, it, he's absolutely right, because the first person, when I'm four of these deep, who comes in with just a whataboutism, I'll snap. I'll lose First my caller. mind. Last caller. Hey, Last caller. No one will ever call again. Heavyweights, like, get on the scale. Get off the scale. <laughs> <laughs> heavyweights is one of the better movies that... Chris, you've never seen it, have you? I've never heard of it. What? Heavyweights? Yeah, Ben Stiller? Never heard of it. Ben Stiller, a bunch of fat kids in the woods. Like, ben, these kids go away to, like, a... Uh, Are you talking about Drill Bit Taylor? No. no they're, kind of, they, so, that's fat kids so, in the woods. Here, here, I can give you it in 30 seconds. A movie, it's a camp to help kids lose weight. Yes. Well, then it gets purchased by the family of, like, Ben Stiller's father. Yes. Who is also played by Ben Stiller. Yeah, Jerry With Stiller. a wig on. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. No, it was actually yeah, Ben, ben Stiller right, just right, playing right. two different guys. I was thinking of, um... um t- Zoolander. <laughs> Zoolander more. He he buys the camp and turns it because he's like a fitness guru. But he's psychotic. But he's nuts. And he buys it and start, he's like, I'm going to make a whole line of these around the country. And this is going to be my testing ground. And I'm going to do all this stuff and make an infomercial out of it. And the There's, kids have to lock him in a cage and he gets nuts. tasered. There's also a Bill's reference in that. The one kid, he tries to kick the one kid out um, who plays Goldberg, the goalie in Mighty Ducks. He's there. And 
Ben Stiller tries to kick him out, but the kid's dad is a lawyer and he comes back in the middle of the night. They're like, oh, we thought like Tony kicked you out. And he's like, no, my dad's a lawyer. So I called him and yada, yada. And the next thing you know, Tony caved like the Bills in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I was like, oh, heavyweights is awesome. And I saw that moment and I was like, fuck you, heavyweights. Like, how <laughs> whoever, dare you? Whoever wrote this is an ass. Right? I'm about to cut up. You know, I'm cutting a promo. Chris, give me my single. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so with that said, it's time for camp. And it's finally time to talk about some things that are interesting because real football stuff is about to happen. Yes. And we're interested in it. So we've all got some things. I'm sure over at Disguise Coverage, you're going to have a lot on camp once it gets started. Mm -hmm. what, what is your blend this time of year? Are you looking still doing film review or are you getting more into the camp stuff with a lean towards film? Once camp starts, from a Bills perspective, I'm fully into what's going on currently with Bills stuff. And then maybe there's something that happens in camp that makes me go back and check something out. But really since my majority of my offseason is going through and going through other teams in the league offensively and defensively that I didn't get to watch enough of during the season or just that intrigued me when it comes to like actual trends and who are like the front runners in terms of scheme and structure and what I think the league is going to look like going forward. Like in some of that ties in the bills, some of it's just how I want to see the game and see the league. Um, but like I've done a bunch of stuff on, I've been talking a bunch about how the bills have been, or I think the Bills should lean into more condensed formations, reduce their formational width, a la a lot of the best offense in the league, like the Niners, the Dolphins, the Lions, the Rams, the Texans. And then particularly, I think a lot of what the Rams and Lions do because they have bigger bodied wide receivers who can function as blockers and they also use condensed formations. I've been studying a lot of their stuff to see what the Bills can use. And so I'm still doing a bunch of that and kind of wrapping things up and putting a bow on it. But once camp starts for the Bills, yeah, it's just the battles I'm looking to see, schematic and structural <clears throat> things that I can see, which I don't really get unless I'm there. Like, because people who regularly go are aren't doing that they're just like man Keon looked great today and I'm like somebody tell me about like <laughs> what kind of formations they were lining up in what was like what was the identity what was the philosophy are you seeing any trends or anything so and especially too because I'm going Wednesday and Thursday um I'm really excited to see like that schematic perspective in addition to a bunch of individual things um but yeah once camp starts it's full speed ahead towards 2024 so they gave you a, a press pass no <laughs> yeah you don't need you definitely don't need one of those. Actually, honestly, too, even like if I got one, I wouldn't want it. Like I sit in the bleachers as high up as I can get because I want that vantage point. I'm looking to see everything. Like I'm we joked about it earlier. I'm trying to get as close to that sideline all 22 angle mm -hmm. as I possibly can get. Um, and then, yeah, go from there. So I'm, I'm pumped. Don't 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 feel bad. Like not getting a press pass. They gave me a press pass. Right. I got a press pass through Eric Turner. From cover one. Oh. Got a press pass. Walked out on the field. Oh, I remember this story, yeah. Trying to take a picture, just walked out on the field. That's Trust me. why they don't get money. Either. We don't need them. We just don't give them. Don't, no. don't give them to people. Because it's for, every, for every relatively intelligent person who would use it for good, there's <laughs> going to be good. there's gonna be 10 Drew Deep Gears out there evil. just bumbling <laughs> their way into the field. Not even evil, just stupidity. Josh Allen! <laughs> Josh! Hey, hey, Josh! You go walking over there like you're going to shake his hand and you just get tackled by security? No, no, it's okay. I just want, I just want to <laughs> shake his hand. I just want to tell him I love him. <laughs> Josh! So with that in mind, and this is one of the reasons that I was really happy about having you here, mm. there's something new this season that none of us have ever seen before, and the structure of it is fascinating. Kickoff returns. Yeah. It's such a small part <clears throat> of the NFL game right now. And yeah. it's been non-existent for years. Which I hate. So, they've decided to revamp it. Yeah. And the crazy thing is that whoever early on in the NFL season can weaponize this yes. will have a massive advantage over their counterparts across the NFL. Yeah. Like, Chris, there's so much that's different about this. So just to kind of lay some things out for you and for our listeners... <clears throat> First of all, the goal is no longer to get the ball inside the end zone. You don't want touchbacks. Uh -huh. and what you also, like, obviously the players are lining up closer together now. And you don't want the same style of kick. In fact, this kind of system almost encourages a rugby squib kick kind of a thing. Like, well, when that, what's the version of, is it Australian football? Like, what's the one where it's like, there's more kicking involved. Right? Australian football, Australian yeah. Australian football. But even with a rugby style kickoff, too, you're not trying to, you can go for distance, but the idea is to get 
good enough distance while maintaining hang time and arc. But granted, rugby is different because if you like, yep. if you get down there in time, you can literally jump in the air and take the ball from the offense mm-hmm. um, from a rugby standpoint. But similar here where you're trying to get the ball to land in a specific landing zone. I think it's literally called like the mm-hmm. landing zone. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. It changes a lot. It changes the entire structure of it. And from where the guys line up to block yep. <clears throat> to how you have to arrange your returners. Yep. Z, 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 two plural s you're gonna have two z. on the field now because to, because of this the, the landing zone and the technique that kickers are gonna be asked to use when they kick off now you can't just have one guy you, you're gonna have to have two so now you have fewer blockers it chain and the blocking is gonna be done within a tire tighter corridor it really does become like rugby mm-hmm. something that you know plenty about yeah how many of your listeners like do you talk about it on your podcast like your rugby history I literally never have so this is something nobody knows this about uh, Anthony Prohaska. He seems fairly mild. He killed a guy. He seems fairly unassuming. He used to be one of the better. Like, what age were you when you were like vying for like national team? Uh, I was in I was in college when I played. Okay, so collegiate age Anthony Prohaska was a wild man with a mohawk who uh, <laughs> who played who played rugby. Yeah. I can get down with mohawks. Yeah, Unless mohawks you- are fun. If I had a couple. <laughs> And so you can probably <laughs> speak a little bit more to how different this is going to be in terms of the actual blocking. Before, you had guys barreling downfield, and everybody kind of is a lane. <clears throat> oh, but yeah. realistically, if you're, the, if you're the return team and you're blocking on behalf of your kick returner, you're coming upfield, and what you're trying to do is displace more than one guy. So you want to get your guy, shove him into this lane, maybe create a crease that with enough speed your guy can find his way to and generate yardage before the defenders collapse on him yeah like that's the philosophy of the standard nfl kick now you're gonna have these guys a lot of how far apart from each other the and shout I, i've done work on this going back to once they like announced it we were just talking about it offline but if you really want honestly a tremendous breakdown sean syed of sumer sports got a hold of like xfl all 22 and broke down like over 400 kickoff reps um and did an entire article up on sumer sports and he breaks down all the rules and everything he has graphics it's absolutely tremendous um you the opponents are so if you're kicking off your you've got 10 people that you're having on basically the return side 40 yard line and then the return team can have as many as nine people or have to have nine people on their own 35 so basically the all the kickoff dudes and all the return dudes that are blocking are basically within like five to seven yards of one another which changes greatly obviously the numbers but then the close proximity it's going to change angles it's going to change lanes it changes strategy and then obviously tying that in with the kickoff aspect of it and not just being even just the basic like i don't know i don't know what the percentage is but like i don't feel like every kickoff is a freaking touchback so like you have to return it now but then with the arc and the angle like it just changes worlds in terms of starting field position how you have to block the opportunity it gives the kickoff team and then all the chicanery and shenanigans the receiving team can get into to Mm -hmm. kind of create problems for the kickoff team and exactly to your point like whoever i think it'll be a thing by like mid-year if someone's out in front early, by mid-season, everyone else is going to kind of catch up and they'll be copycatting and putting things in a little bit. But if somebody can weaponize the kickoff game or the return game early on, it legitimately could be a thing that wins somebody two or three games in the first half of the season because they're at an advantage position or in an advantageous position that no one else is ready to catch up on. I'm super pumped for it. Just Devin Hester is one of my favorite players of all time, and I loved how much of a factor he was in games. And so it pains me that every kickoff, every kickoff's the same thing. We know they're going to kick it off. You're not going to take it. You're going to start where you're going to start. The only thing you're waiting to see is like, uh uh-oh, did somebody like miss and kick it out of bounds? And they're Mm going to start at the 40. Like there's no, there's There's no no drama drama to it. No. So I like that the NFL was, I was reactive here, but somewhat proactive in terms of addressing it and moving forward. One of the things that becomes the most interesting is that it changes the build kind of like rugby does. It changes the physical makeup of the guys you want on your kick return units. Yes. And on your on your your defensive kicking yeah. units. It's not you're not just putting bodies out there to like, oh, get them some teams, reps, or do this. You need like actual So to look people. at this, to give the, to give that some context, guys. So I took a look at our special team snaps from last year. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Reggie Gilliam, mm-hmm. Tyler Matakavich, mm-hmm. Saran Neal, mm-hmm. Cam Lewis. Mm-hmm. Those are your four 
top players in terms of the percentage of special team snaps that they took, which tells you they're, they're on punt cover, they're on punt return, mm-hmm. they're on kick return and probably kick coverage. Unit. Yeah. They're probably running all four units. One of them is a fullback, one of them is a smaller linebacker, mm. one of them is a safety, and one of them is a safety. Mm. <laughs> Those are some small bodies. Yeah. Now, the problem is going to be if you're in a tight window, and let's say you're the team that decides, hey, you know what we're going to do? We don't have a lot of guys like this who we think are fast, that we think can catch up. Mm. Or So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to put out bigger guys like rugby's props Mm. and we're going to say we're going to take some offensive linemen backups and we're going to put them out there on this unit to Mm. see if they can bulldoze and create some creases Mm. for our returners to flow through you now as the coverage team are going to be at a significant disadvantage if you're trying to put saran neal up against some team's sixth guard Mm. or like sixth you know swing interior line that could become a real problem And it could give you, as the team that's doing it... Now, mind you, this guy is not going to have downfield blocking ability Mm. because he's just not that fast. Other guys will catch up to him if he's trying to make, you know, leading blocks down the field. Mm. But if all you want is a guy at the point of attack once the kick has been fielded to create a crease that that guy can get through, you might see defensive linemen out there. You're, you're guys, if teams decide to carry a fifth defensive end or fifth defensive tackle, mm. you could see that guy out there on those in those situations. And it changes everything we've kind of come to know about how this works. Mm. And what's even crazier is that there's no like none of these teams know what the other team's doing. There's no tape on. This. Yeah, there's no sample size or, or, or bar. So week one of the NFL season is going to be absolutely yes. crazy. Yeah. The preseason even. Yeah. Because you're going to see some team go out there and say, listen, we're going to put maulers out there. We're allowed a 90-man roster. What do I care? We're going to load that lineup with a whole boatload of fat guys, and we're going to see what happens. And if you are the Bills trotting out a bunch of DBs, you're going to be in trouble. That see what happens part is cool because teams are going to lean heavy. Some teams might lean more speed and athleticism. Like, it's going to be a mix until you figure out because – it. This point, everyone thinks, maybe not necessarily everyone, but thinks like, I know the right way to maximize this. I got the key. And some people might, yeah, might be leaning into more of the speed thing. Some people might lean into more big heavies. And then how do you kind of counteract that? Where do we see, where what do we see for the baseline or kind of barometer get set in terms of like, this is the standard thing that works best. So this is what everyone is doing. The league will figure it out. Yes, and then everybody's going to adjust based off of that, and then you just keep going. Chris, if you can pull up uh, our lads for the Bills, just so we can take a look at the roster as we're talking about this. Also, real quick, this is, this Whiskey Sour is phenomenal. You crushed Thanks. this. This is very good. Uh, I I made it with Woodenville in the port casks. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I do have a Woodenville single barrel, which is like 117, but... Hmm. Uh, I'm looking out for you driving later. Appreciate you. <laughs> fine. Yeah, this drink was great. I'm in a ditch. Can you get me? Uh, Chris, your cocktails were awesome also. Yeah, I don't want you to drive yeah. home like Jack Perry. God. Nice. You get that because you love wrestling. <laughs> yes. He used yes. to be Jungle Boy. Now he's in the Elite. Just complete character change, scapegoat and everything. <laughs> Wild. So here's what happens. You now have to look at who the Buffalo Bills have on the roster. Like This is going to be fascinating throughout camp to watch how the Bills approach the kick coverage and the kick returns. Yes. Because, again, it's everybody's trying to find a philosophy. Yes. You know, you have some teams who, like, when you, when you look at what makes up the backups on our team, and you think about who this rule change might benefit the most, Yeah. I'd say it's probably backup offensive linemen mm. who are vying for a, a spot. Probably, you know... Some of these linebackers mm. who we have, who they're bigger than defensive backs, yeah. you probably want that combination of size and speed at this point, right? Yeah. And at the same time, there's this terrifying thing that when you look at returners, returners themselves need a different physical makeup now. Yes, yeah, so it's a with, specific skill set. So having played rugby... When you take a look at, you know, you could have all the speed in the world, but tell me how a guy built like Xavier Worthy would have done trying to play rugby. Oh, man. It's funny because we had a dude one time who was like 100 and like 
65 pounds like soaking wet but he could fly and he played wing so we just get him the ball on the wing okay. and he would just take so, off so, but, so he has a specific role that he can do this one thing yeah but it, it change again it changes the, the the dynamic of even just who you're looking for at a returner like the nature of kickoff returns and punt returns when they were the, the standard what they have been for forever we're different in general. Like the t- trajectory of a, of a punt is different than the trajectory of a kick. Re- your receiving conditions in a punt were different than your receiving conditions in a kickoff. Now, all the trajectory and kick style is almost similar more to a punt or a rugby style kick, mm-hmm. which we've seen rugby style <clears throat> kickers become punters in different things. So it leans to a different type of catch strategy. But then also, yeah, from a body type standpoint, like – how much of a runway is going to be able to be created for the kickoff returner now based off of the starting point, based off the timing? So do you want a burner? Do you want somebody with a little more thickness? Do you want like somebody who can break tackles? Like what type of skill set and body type are you looking to have back there? The first thing I thought when I was thinking about having this conversation is I go, where the fuck is Christian Wade now? Where is That's Christian Wade now? Point. That's also a super good point. Where, your, where's, where's your God now? Where is he? <laughs> All of the truthers for Christian Wade. Do you yeah. know how loud they would be if he was around right now? He, yeah, kick returner. I don't know why oh he's not God. politicking to come back. Yeah, actually, that's super funny, actually. We should go get that guy. <laughs> yeah, get Christian Wade. Instead of Grable Stevenson, whatever the fuck his name is, get oh, We're going to talk about that in our next podcast. Oh, I, I'm going to save that one. Oh, boy. But. Because he's a wrestler and you love wrestling. <laughs> Different kind of wrestling. So, this is. You need more of what I would think when you compare what we've historically seen. Mm. Devin Hester, kick returner, mm. cornerback. A mm. lot of times you'll see a guy who's a wide receiver yeah. taking kicks. You almost need a body type and a skill set that's more of, if you think about what this line is going to be now, because now you're not talking about guys crashing downfield from distance and there being a million lanes that they can use their speed through. It's going to be like the collision that happens at the offensive line. You almost want a running back skill set. Yes. And so with that in mind, I look at the Bills returners and I go, the league zigged and we zagged and I don't know what I'm looking at now. Because we go into the draft and we draft Daquan Hardy. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a a depth cornerback behind a depth cornerback. Like, I wouldn't expect him to come in. And he's small. He's small. From a frame standpoint. And everyone will go, well, Teron Johnson's small. Yeah, but he's like 190 pounds. Yeah. Didn't Daquan Hardy like 100 and... He's very light. Yeah, he's lighter than Taron Johnson. He's very light. Taron Johnson's small because he's like a DB, but he's like, he's thicker. He's yeah. not He's not thin framed. It's why he's been able to hold up playing yeah. the physical brain. It's why he fits the he run. He takes on pulling guards because he's a, a little bit of a mini powerhouse. So when you look at Daquan Hardy, when he was drafted, a lot of people were like, oh no, he's going to get a chance to compete for the kicking job. I don't know that I want that guy. Being our kick returner. I want, given, I want Christian Wade. <laughs> given his physical makeup, he might be too small oh. and too green to have developed the vision to know what he's looking at. Because, again, these are guys who came out of college. Yeah. They don't know what this thing's going to look like. They're going to be smashing into the back of the You know what's funny, too, line. is I think of, oh, I forget who it was, the Chiefs signed that sick rugby dude, I think, from Wales. His name? Uh, I forget. It's like a hyphenated Christian name. Okoye. No, <laughs> the Nigerian nightmare. Louis Rees Zamet. Yes, thank you. Yep. And he's if he's Welsh, right? Yes, yes. Who dude can fly? Um, crazy fast winger for Wales. Um, also, really, just if on topic of rugby, Netflix did a really sweet documentary on the Six Nations tournament from last year. Okay, uh, Six Nations is one of you. Obviously, have the Rugby World Cup, but then Six Nations is like the major stuff for. Europe, so it's England and Scotland and Wales and all the best teams uh, from Europe and France, and they just go nuts. And Zamet was featured in that because he's like super good. And I wonder, like, oh man, if ever there was just like, oh, the Chiefs just ahead in speed, ha ha ha. And I was like, is he gonna return their kicks? Is he gonna return their kicks and be sweet? Mm-hmm. And I, I lean kind of to your your thought process here of like looking towards more of a running back style like skill set i'm looking towards more of not just like i'm not looking for just like isaiah mckenzie or khalil shakir yeah i'm trying to find more of like a thicker scat back if i could like type of dude like so where i go with this is i take a look and i go say okay so if i'm not if i don't like daquan hardy kj hamler 
guy has a history of being impactful, returning kicks to the collegiate level. Yeah. Makes sense you would bring him in to kind of vie for this job. He can fly. Except the job changed. And so now, again, they're going to give him, he's going to get reps. The question is, how impactful can he be? Yeah. And I have a feeling that if you were to put Daquan Hardy, K.J. Hamler, and Ty Johnson, oh, I was gonna say Ty Johnson in a three-man contest for who wins his kick returner job, I kind of want to see Ty Johnson doing it. My, if I in an ideal world, if you told me the person would never get injured, I it would be between Curtis Samuel and Ty Johnson for me. Okay, but I don't want to. I don't want to say waste. Well, I don't want to put Curtis Samuel in that role. So, but Chris, if you scroll down here at our lads, they have our kick returner listed as Khalil Shakir, and whoever wrote this list obviously doesn't ever listen to Sean McDermott talk. Which mm. makes sense. Or I'm not you. faulting him. They better not listen to me. See, <laughs> now look, punt returner, they've got Daquan Hardy. <clears throat> cool. Makes sense. I understand that. Yeah, that right. makes sense. Khalil Shakir, Sean McDermott's gone on record and said he doesn't like to put starters yeah. as a return man. If you're a return man, like your role is return man. And the reason why is because he believes that he says, in the event of an injury, mm-hmm. I now not only have to shuffle one position, I have to shuffle two. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And he'd rather have to deal with those each in a vacuum. Like every replacing for injury in the middle of a game, mm-hmm. each thing in a vacuum is how he chooses to. And that's sensible, right? I'd rather have to fix one hole than plug two. Yeah. Why shoot yourself in the foot twice Yeah. when Khalil Shakir pulls a hamstring week one and you're like, all right, well, now what? Now I don't have a second wide receiver, and I also don't have a guy yeah, to, to return, return my kicks. Yeah, absolutely. So with that said, you could maybe see Curtis. Like, I'm just wondering, like, who's going to take reps here? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you guarantee me there'd be no injuries, I'd be like, sweet Curtis Samuel. Because mm-hmm. his build, his frame, his skill set, everything. But because of that, my yeah, my first thought was Ty Johnson. I just think he's got enough juice. He's got some thickness. The vision the the straight line speed but also enough wiggle to him i don't think they have anybody that's going to be this dynamic game changing returner but my money would be on just of who i'd want but also just from what we know about mcdermott i my money would be on ty johnson yeah so we have we've talked about the difference in size of the blocking units yeah like i think they're going to get bigger that's my guess is that you're going to see some bigger players maybe not across the board but I think that you're going to see more backup offensive linemen and defensive linemen creeping into this throughout training camps around the NFL. Mm. Because I think they're going to be experimenting. Who creates the best lanes for this guy to get outside of? Yeah, it's like Cedric Van Payne Granger could be a real asset. I can't return because of the size with some athleticism, is, little things. Because you're thinking about on my depth chart for game day, how many offensive linemen can I activate? And yeah. the NFL changed the rules a couple years ago that you can carry an extra offensive lineman mm. on the game day roster. Like, you can have an extra roster spot as long as it's a lineman. Yeah. So with that said, you could put Van Pan, Van Pran Granger in a Bills uniform on Sundays and have him playing this role on special teams for you where he's still blocking. Yeah. He's doing the thing you ask him to do. And who says you don't get a mismatch? And we decide to go heavy. It's rock, paper, scissors now. Exactly. If somebody decides to go light and you go heavy. Who wins? You could be creating a massive hole. Now, maybe those guys get beat to a spot yeah. because they're not as fast as the linebacker. Maybe you're getting knifed and they're shooting through you, but maybe you're just bodying them and there's just gaps and lanes. And that's what I think is so fun about, like, it's it's such a small thing, but, like, the chess match of it, of, like, do you go speed? Do you go heavy? Do you try and do a balance of the two? Where do you put your speed? Where do you put your heavies on both sides of it? And how do you, like, mix it? It's a really, like, fun conversation. Now, Chris, it can be. It, it sounds like you're yeah. almost like you're, you guys are describing the kick six. Mm. Are you aware of the kick six? Yeah. The, uh, Auburn, the Alabama. Auburn specific one? Yeah. Because yeah, Auburn went heavy, and those fat asses couldn't get to the sideline. Damn. Chris Davis burns it up the sideline. That's line. one of the best like football moments well, ever. Did you know? That, well, because you know, I don't know if you know, that my brother went to Auburn. I did not know this. He was a graduate of Auburn. Okay. So I was going to one game a year. You like, went to that game? No. Oh, okay. I was going to one game a year, but I was in the uh, the Jason Campbell years. Oh, okay. Cadillac Williams, Ronnie oh, Brown. Oh man, those that's teams are bro- so good. That's when my brother was in Tommy college. Tommy Tuberville. So then when I, I meet this dickhead, that's and you. he likes Alabama. Oh, so yeah, that's right. For the longest Ooh. time, Drew's ringtone was the Auburn radio call <laughs> of the Kick Six. <laughs> I love that. This is what friendship Chris Davis! is. Yeah. This is what this is what friendship. You're not gonna is all kick about. him off the field tonight. That's so good. That's one of the top like ten. 
football, like college, Moments NFL, ever. anything ever. Just especially too because it was Auburn, Alabama, oh, and it happened old. to Alabama. When it happened, man, I literally turned off the TV, shut off my living room light. I'm in my 620 square foot bachelor pad apartment. I shut the TV off. I turned off the light. I had a beer fridge in my living room. I grabbed a beer and I just laid there on my living room floor in the dark. Just alone. In shambles. Just alone, just quietly like, what the fuck did I just see? I can't imagine. And then I walked to the bar because I was like, the walk there will help me get out whatever I need to get out before I walk through that door. Fair. Because I'm not looking to get kicked out tonight. Fair. <laughs> so I need, to, fair. I, need to, I need to shake this off. And the, just the wall of profanity. That I was walking through the village imagine. of the, the village of Lancaster with, and at least it's drowned out by like all the amazing success that Bama has had. But if like it yeah. hadn't, like that's such a because that's a thing that that's does a Billsy it. moment. That's a hundred. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm getting at. Like that's a hundred percent a Billsy moment. That's not something that happens to like Alabama. Like if that happened, you would think it would be the opposite. Like oh man, every time <laughs> this is the last time I was here. It's yeah, sabotage. That beer has those. not been touched. Since it, yeah. it's, it's been I think it's in me. Fridge, untaken. Yeah, you, well, me, no, I'm doing. The, I don't know if my superpower is this or the ability to short unmoved, circuit the system. Un, it, it, he used to laugh so hard it broke the recording equipment. Yeah, but there's one more mm. key piece to this kick thing that I need everybody to listen to, and I need you to hear me because I'm 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 staking something right now, Chris. You can put. I want to put a Seagrams on it. Oh, there is going to be at least one murder. At least oh, no. <laughs> four season-ending injuries oh, to damn. starting oh, NFL kickers this year. There oh, is going to be. Okay. I'm calling my shot People now. are going to rock the kickers. No, do you want to know why? So the, the, there's a really good article that I'll tweet out from The Athletic. That they talked about some of the statistics around the XFL. Because that's where repeat, this all came from. Can you repeat that again for me? Four kickers, minimum, four kickers will be placed on IR this season. Season yeah. ending? Season ending. Because that's a different, because you can be put on IR and come Fine. back. We won't call it season ending, but IR. Okay. Four different kickers, starting kickers in the NFL will go on IR this year, which is high. That's high if you think about it across No, that's the a good, uh, kick, yeah, kickers never. So here's, here's one of the things they found. Your beer is so foamy. Still. It's still foamy. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. It's like one of those volcano like science projects. You, from a Bill, you, you bought a twelve pack of like booby traps. Is what you did. Well, this happened last time with like three. Not my them. problem. I don't drink beer. Mm, the man of class. Yeah, Just I was going to say he's a man of class. Distinguished gentleman. Yeah, added it to the board. So, kickers were involved on forty percent of the kicks, either in as a tackler. Or in chase down situations where they have to try to, hey, I'm going to shade and I'm going to go this way and force him either to the sideline or to other tacklers. Mm -hmm. When you think about how many soft tissue injuries we see in the NFL on a week to week basis, mm -hmm. especially this time of year in training camp, Fair. right? Yeah. How many guys get hurt? And these are players who have spent their whole careers training their bodies to make these quick cutting side to side motions. And now what you've done is you've taken a whole class of athlete that, yes, they're athletes, yeah. but this has not been a core part of their training mm -hmm. for their entire lives, and yeah. you've thrust them into, into a position, yeah. right? One of the things I tried to compare it to when I was having this conversation with a friend of mine was that it would be, it, it's like the difference between having the DH spot and not having it in baseball. Oh, good where call. Where you've got pitchers who don't have to hit. Yeah, And then all of a sudden you go out west and they go, well, they, the rules are depending on where you play because baseball is fucking lame. D oh, different rules so depending good. on geography. Damn. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Shoot that in the face. But either way. You're a hater. <laughs> oh, I'm one of the biggest haters <laughs> of everything. Yeah. No Enjoy one your foam beer, you fuck. When I'm hungover, my wife actually, like, she doesn't find it as funny now that we're, like, a decade in. Mm. But she used to get a kick out of the fact that when I'm, like, real hungover, mm -hmm. which also we have kids, I don't get, I don't get drunk enough to have those kind of hangovers anymore. Mm -hmm. But I could literally just verbally eviscerate anything. You give me a topic, I can shit all over it. That's I can, I can buy that 100%. Bring up Europe. I'll tear it apart. I'll make fun of I'll make fun of everybody's culture and it can be completely like it it doesn't have it, pasteurization. Louis Pasteur was a piece of shit. That guy sucks and let me tell you why. And, and nothing matters and we're all going to die. And because <laughs> being hungover, I'm already a nihilist that takes you I to was the say, Yeah, just another level of nihilism. And so 
I hate the fact that you have guys who have to play by a different set of rules because when you look at bat- pitchers who try to bat, uh-huh. they're terrible. Unless you show Yotani. Fair. And it's more you're more of an injury concern too. Once they if they got on base, yes. then they have to run the bases. You don't want that guy running yeah, bases no. because what he pulls a hammy. Why? Because yeah. he doesn't. Know, he's not been running bases yeah. for most of his career. Yeah. So with that in mind, I think that you're you're already seeing some teams start to tinker. The Kansas City Chiefs mm. are a team that are tinkering now. We just talked about how they signed this yeah, this rugby player, yeah, potentially for a kick return role. Last season, because of injury, they had to bring in that safety. Uh, what Justin, Justin Reed? I, do, I was kick. literally thinking. So I want to see teams be like, our kickoff kicker isn't going to be our kicker. It's going to be an actual position player who we just need to pooch it like thirty yards away to get in the land of the landing zone, and then can go make a play. So you're going to see that if you're paying attention at training camp. If you mm-hmm. take the walk to St. John Fisher. You're going to be able to go watch the kickers because they always work separate from the rest of the team. Like the yeah, seven on sevens and the, the eleven shadows. on elevens are happening on one field, and almost always they're inside the stadium, like Brownie Stadium. They'll be in there, yeah, rather than on the outside. Behind stadium. you, if you're sitting in the stands, they are behind you where yes. you can't see, almost in the chamber of secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is you're going to be able to go out there and say, "Hey, I see Tyler Bass, and I see Lou, I see Reed Ferguson." And I see Keon Coleman. <laughs> well, this is it. And you go, wait, who who the fuck is that guy? Yeah. Why do they have a defensive lineman out there? Why why, why is Daquan Jones kicking? Why what is happening? Yeah. What are we doing here? But you're gonna see this stuff around the NFL and it's not lunacy. What it is is you're protecting your investment in the guy you want to be able to hit a forty yarder later in the game to win it for you. Mm. You're, how many games we haven't had a ton. One of the things I've talked to Reed about, he hasn't had a lot of game winning field goal like attempts. In his career, mm. he hasn't had to have them. Yeah, but we've had some. There was the walk off, like walk off style kicks, like the one against Baltimore, the one against Miami in the snow. In the snow, the Saturday night game. There's been a couple. You want Tyler Bass, regardless of what you think about him as a kicker. You want your kicker. You want him in those you moments. Want your kicker in, to kick. Do you want to risk not having him for that moment because you decided that he needed to also be in your kickoff unit? Mm. And so there's going to be a lot of teams who are asking that question. And so it's going to be fun to see what the Bills do. Now, they may take the traditional approach. Sean McDermott's conservative. Mm -hmm. He may just say, this is what I know. We're going to keep. We're going to stick with it. He may have the punter take some kicks. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be some exotic shit going on around the NFL when it comes to that position because people don't want to risk. You don't want Justin Tucker if you're the Ravens. Oh, man. You don't want Justin Tucker going down in week two. Because he blew out a knee because a kicker, got, a returner got outside containment and he had to go try to juke and catch this guy. God forbid he had to try to tackle him. You're not going to see that. And so in that way, it's going to be interesting to find out how teams get around this. I think that's another fair point. Yeah, that's a that's another like cool layer and lens. And because, again, you're not you don't need somebody who can boom it and kick it out of the end zone or like it's a deep, it's a longer kick. So trying to get it to land in a specific area is a little harder. Like it's not, and you just need someone with enough arc who can provide enough distance. And then you trust in your kick coverage team and you kind of play the numbers from there. Yeah. That's a cool point. So there's going to be a lot of stuff to watch as training camp unfolds. Hmm. And this thing, this special teams thing, I never thought I would go into a year like this where that's one of my primary focuses, but there we are. That's what I care about. There's also obviously going to be the wide receiver competition. Mm. But I think it's more nuanced than people realize because they're just looking at individual skill sets going, well, player X is better than player Y. Yeah. And player Z is worse than those two, so this is how you should slot them. As someone who likes the schematic part of football, you can speak to this a little bit. Here's what I look at. The size of cornerbacks in the NFL kind of dictates that slot receiver can be a profound mismatch if you have the right size, the right physical makeup. A Dalton Kincaid against most teams' slot corners is a pretty good matchup. Dalton Kincaid against most teams' linebackers is a matchup you like. Mm -hmm. The NFL has just become like college football. I don't you, you need individual skill sets that are good. You need good players. But at the same time, it's almost more about what position can I get into the matchup that benefits mm. me the most. Mm. And when you look at what they've done with this year's wide receiver depth chart, like here's the thing I thought about. Baltimore, 
the year that they came here during COVID and played the Bills in the divisional round to go to the AFC title game, mm-hmm. they had it, they had just tankers at cornerback. All three of their cornerbacks. Uh, who did they have? It was um, Marlon Humphrey. Humphrey? Oh, no. Yeah, Humphrey. Yeah, Humphrey was banged up that year, but played. They had Humphrey. They had that one guy that they drafted in the first round a long time ago, and he wasn't great, but he wasn't terrible. Jimmy Smith? Uh, Jimmy Smith. I don't know if he's still there. Uh, Look it up. Look up the Chris, roster. 2020 Ravens roster. I just remember that they had a six foot two slot corner sometimes, uh-huh. depending on who the Bills rolled out on the field, and it ground our offense that had been just burning, you know, kind of flying all season. It ground everything to a halt. Yeah. And so when you saw that, I, I think to myself, I go, okay, this is kind of gives this gives them an advantage because most teams aren't built this way. Yes. And teams don't know how to rock paper scissors when every cornerback on the field is over six foot one. Yes, fair call. I don't, I don't know, and, they're, and they play physical. I don't know what to do with that. But by, that's what made them special. Most teams are not that. And so what you have is now you have a bunch of players on the Bills roster. When you look at the wide receiver depth chart, like, Chris, what do we got here? Hell, I knew it. Peters. Peters yeah. was the outside. It was Peters and Humphrey on the outside. Okay, so Peters smaller, but obviously it didn't matter. Scroll up real quick, Chris. I think that'll give you a scroll up again. I think past this, keep going, keep going up. I think it's going to give you the starters who saw the most reps. Keep going, keep going. Yep. Boom. Keep going down. All the starters, Marcus Peters and Humphrey. Yep. Oh, Corners. So it, doesn't, it doesn't give their nickel. No. Yeah. So either way. Fair. Because I remember during the broadcast, too, they were talking about it, how they were like, oh, these giant cornerbacks are just a lot for the Bills receivers. Yeah. Well, now we have some guys who, if we, Chris, if you go back to the Our Lads page for Buffalo, We've got some guys who have a physical makeup that can give teams a lot of trouble in the middle of the field. Mm. We don't have a lot on the boundary. That's why Marvis Veldez Scantling was here. Mm. Mm. <laughs> he, we needed one guy who could get on the outside and have enough speed to make you think as a defensive coordinator that maybe leaving a safety on that side of the field might be a good idea. Mm. Now, whether he catches the ball or not, that's a completely other conversation. Mm. <laughs> but... We brought him in because we knew we needed a guy who could primarily play outside who had speed. Mm. When you look at everybody else, Matt Collins, he's taking snaps out of the slot, he's taking snaps out wide. Keon Coleman, you're assuming they can do a lot of that. Dalton Kincaid is a slot weapon. Yes. Dawson Knox can also operate close to the line of scrimmage or split out a little bit wider, but obviously not working the boundary, but he'll get out. Yeah. I mean, you said something interesting when you were talking about what you, the work you were kind of doing over the summer, looking at all these different teams, mm-hmm. and you were talking about how the Bills might, with their bigger-bodied players, want to change the fit of their offense, mm-hmm. some of their plays, and some schematic things they could get into. This seems, like when you look at the makeup of the depth chart, because there's so much size, how do you handicap this going in there? I mean, obviously, Curtis Samuel's here. Yeah. Khalil Shakir's here. Yeah. That's your speed. Those are your kind of satellite guys. If you're talking about Shakir, that's a guy who can work the intermediate for you. But everybody else, like, this is unorthodox compared to what we've seen recently from the Bills. Fair. I I think the top... I think the top five are set at wide receiver. Not necessarily in order. I think Coleman, Samuel, Shakir, Mac Collins, and then MBS are going to make the team. And then it's going to depend on special team stuff or other offense stuff or... How much of an actual offensive player do you see Matt Collins as, or do you see him more as a special teamer? And then based off of that whole dynamic, who do you want as your sixth receiver, be- or yeah, as your like last man to make the squad at receiver? Because do you want size? Do you want speed? What is Matt Collins? And then I think really it's going to become between Claypool. Um, honestly, there, you can make a case for anybody, like Claypool, Hamler, uh, the prince that was promised, Justin Shorter, uh, <laughs> Andy Isabella, like whoever you want to make a case for. Um, but I really do think I, I, I keep looking at the receiver room in conjunction with the tight end room. And Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir, if you look at the receivers that I think are going to make the squad paired with the tight ends, Samuel and Shakir are kind of outliers versus the rest of that group. The rest of that group is basically a combination of size and athleticism run blocking and pass catching even though Curtis Samuel is actually a better run blocker than he gets credit for and Khalil Shakir made a lot of strides last year as a run blocker as well especially towards the end of the year he's legitimately inserting and fitting up on duo and doing a whole bunch of stuff um you had some 
No. No, fair enough. Um, I didn't know if your beer was about to fall. My, <laughs> my beer's going to explode a second <laughs> time. I'm just waiting for the can to just <laughs> nuke. Um, so I, I think you look at the size and frame and athleticism, run blocking and pass catching ability, and that's what I mentioned earlier with like the condensed formations. When you go and reduce your formational width, you can get to more in your run game. There's less tells between the run and the pass, and you can marry more of your run and your pass. And I think the run game is going to be the foundational aspect of this Bills offense. Yes, the offense is still going to be run through Josh Allen. I'm not saying they're going to be like a 60-40 run team or even 50-50. But the run game is, I think, where everything starts for the Bills. The running back run game. And then even in addition to that with Josh Allen. And when you look at what the Bills can do out of 12 personnel, so putting Kincaid and Knox on the field, you can go traditional like wing-wing looks where Kincaid and Knox are attached to the formation on either side or hipped off of one another. You can have them lined up in more your traditional, like, heavier type of looks. Or you can go spread and go two-by-two gun and have Kincaid in a slot and Knox in a slot. Or you can go trips to one side and Kincaid is the basically the X receiver on the side by himself. Then you could do the exact same thing with your 11 personnel grouping. If you take an 11 personnel grouping up, which means you have three receivers, of Keon Coleman, Mac Hollins, MBS. Keon Coleman... Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, all these things, you can go, obviously, spread, and you can go gun and empty and do all these things you want to do, or you can go with condensed formations, because guess what? Your bigger-bodied, physical, athletic receivers can also function as run blockers, and that's where you put a defense into a bind, because now the defense, when they... It, I'm sure everyone knows. I don't think what I'm about to say is revelatory, but you see a personnel grouping coming in. So the guys up in the box are like, up oh, there, they're, you know, they're bringing in 13 personnel. Take out our nickel corner. Let's bring in another linebacker or a big nickel or a safety or something. You're trying to match personnel on personnel. But now you have to hope if you're a defense that you have a nickel that's physical enough and sound enough in the run and also in coverage <laughs> to function against 11 personnel who can actually be receivers or 12 personnel in the run or 12 personnel in the pass, 11 personnel. In and the that's why I invoked the the 2020 Ravens. Yeah. Because they were special in the size and skill they had at corner. Mm. You're not running into a lot of teams in the AFC that are built like that right no. now. And even the Ravens offense too, which everybody like made fun of for so long because all oh, Greg Roman and this and that they were such a problem offensively because the league was all like we're going spread and passing it and the Ravens were like no nah, we're gonna put 17 fullbacks on the field and we're just gonna run power down your throat and then we'll go play action every once in a while and teams were like well, well yeah but we need you to pass so we can rush your quarterback and I was like no we're just gonna <laughs> no, run it all the no, time we have a fullback his last name is Ricard and yeah. he's one of the craziest things yeah. that the NFL's ever seen he gets no love no, he's, he's so awesome if you like watching the that. game of football if you like smash mouth old school football I know Kyle Juszczyk was like the hot name for fullbacks. No, 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 no. Go watch Ricard play fullback. It's throwback shit. He's just, a, yeah. He's they, a, and they line him up everywhere. Like, he can be a traditional fullback. They'll line him up as an H. He used to play defensive tackle. Like, he can do so much. And, yeah, you when you have those kind of chess pieces, and to kind of go back to one of the things you said. Go he's ahead. a fullback at 311 pounds. Yeah. He's a fullback blocking for running backs over 300 pounds. And they can also line him up in H and have him, like, pick up an edge rusher. You, or, like, a Blake. He can do something. It's ferocious watching that guy play football. I've been in love with him his entire career. He's so fun. And the Ravens do so many cool things, like, and, again, that kind of goes in that conversation of the mismatch creation. You don't have... I know everybody wants to say, like, and I've said this so many times, like, I know everybody said, like, good riddance and Stephon Diggs sucks and he was washed. He wasn't washed. He doesn't suck. Like, if you watch the tape down the stretch, he was not as bad as everyone is making him out to be, even though everybody's like, he dropped that one pass against the Chiefs. That's what his career is. He sucks. These are the WGR callers. That's so... You can't listen to them. They'll make I you want to... My, <laughs> thi my thing with that is, if you're going to show that Diggs clip where, like, oh, he dropped that pass against Kansas City, cool. Show the ones against Jacksonville where Allen underthrew him or overthrew him. Show the one against New England where Allen overthrew him. Show the pass throws. against Miami where he caught the underthrown ball and slides in it like the five-yard oh line God. that sets up the Dawson Knox game-winning touchdown. Such a beautiful play. Also, earlier in that game, he cooks Jalen Ramsey. Allen misses him. Like I, People make mistakes. It happens. But everyone wants to drag Diggs because <sighs> we hate him and he's out, so he's not a Bill anymore. He was always terrible. He sucks. He's a diva, yada, yada. On paper, you are not a better football team without Stephon sure. Diggs. Now, does that mean you You're, can't mitigate that loss? And this is it. It doesn't mean you suck. It means now we have to do what we were doing differently. 
and you have you have in, to win more with the scheme. You and have you've to push invested more in the pieces that will yeah. allow you to do so many different things. Yes, and that's why the wide receiver competition and even just as an extension of that competition to see what they want in that last wide receiver spot, but how they deploy them is yes. going to be one of the most interesting things about Bill's training camp this summer. Absolutely, because it, it's it's one of my main focuses. I'm going to be talking about it on my show Tuesday with Joe Marino. Um, just that that conversation because so much of the best offenses in the NFL have a lot of like good pieces but it's it's about the mismatch creation that you can have you take a team like the 49ers their whole offense is mismatch creators Christian yep. McCaffrey can do so much Debo can do so much Ayuk is a true X Kittle is the best all around tight end when you talk about a pass catching receiver threat but also being a run blocker and then you have this trump card in Kyle Juszczyk. So you can be in 22 personnel or 21. Kyle Juszczyk can go line up out wide and run routes. So if you're yep. a defense, you go, oh, who's going to cover Juszczyk? Is it is it our linebacker? Like, is it a nickel? Well, because we can't waste too many because we they also got like Debo and Kittle's and so out there. So if you there decide, and, hey, I'm going to commit a safety to this, George Kittle's already looking at the quarterback like, you saw that, right? Yeah, you see that? You see, you saw who moved. Find me. I'm, are, are I'm going to be here. Are you creating individual one-on-one mismatches? Yeah. Are you forcing a defense out of two high looks, and now you can kind of make them declare their their coverage structure and shell on the back end earlier? Yep. And offenses, the, the Lions are a really good example, right? And granted, they have one of, one of the best offensive lines in football. Their receiver who had the most snaps was Amon Ross St. Brown. Their receiver who had the second most snaps was Josh Reynolds. Their receiver that had the third most snaps, Donovan Peoples-Jones. Bigger bodied, mashing type of wide receivers who function as run blockers, but who also can get out and do stuff in the pass. They lean into that. The Rams, obviously tremendous with Sean McVay, tremendous receivers and pass catchers. Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua block like their tight ends. Mm-hmm. So you've got these receivers who are tremendous pass catchers, but who also can block their ass off. And even going back to Detroit, Amon Ross St. Brown is there on tape, digging out safeties and cracking on edges and and, cracking on second level dudes, erasing nickels, cutting edges. When you've got those guys who can live in those worlds, it forces the defense to have to honor both the run and the pass and then figure out those ways. And if they go heavier to match the run, cool. Can those dudes cover? And if those dudes can cover, cool, flip it back. Can they can they fit the run? And if you they can't answer both of those questions, you lean into that. If they can't function against your run game, we're just going to run it down your throat five yards of carry and go up and down the field like we did against Dallas. If your bigger-bodied, heavier dudes can't cover Dalton Kincaid or can't bang with Keon Coleman downfield, we're going to lean into the pass. And then you add in the condensed formation aspect while also being able to flip it and go spread at the same time. And then you have to account for Josh Allen's legs. And I just, I expect a lot more condensed formations, play action, bootlegs, marrying the run in the pass while still having the ability to go spread and really put a defense on their ass because they have to account for so much. And that's a very hard thing to do. And then real quick, because I know we're running long and Chris is going to get frustrated with me. The thing that I'm looking at from the defense, because we've talked about special teams, we've talked about offense. For the defense, it's just how does everything slot behind Greg Rousseau? He's our D1 by default. Have we reached a place where Von Miller is viewed in the eyes of this coaching staff as not that you're not valuable, but that we would rather have you with legs in the third and fourth quarter when we need it on third downs and on fourth downs, Mm. potentially, depending on the game, the opponent. Do we, just given his injuries and his age and everything else and just how unproductive he was last year, is this where they see him as a closer, quote-unquote, and then is this the year that A.J. Epinesa gets his look at starting reps? I think you're, you're flirting with it. I think if you, if you did it, you wouldn't upset me. I think that's what it's it is. It's similar to when uh, uh-huh. Kevin Green came to WCW with Mongo <laughs> oh, McMichael. That. <laughs> love that. Great reference. That was a good time. I that was a good you time. Guys. You love that. Yeah, you're all about the old WCW. So one of the things I'll be looking at as I'm kind of going over reports and I'm t- talking, listening to podcasts from the people who are there, what does a defensive end rotation look like? Because there exists a world where, Chris, if you want to scroll down and we just real quick before we close the show... Dwayne Smoot is, he's not a household name, Oh, he. Oh, but he's I, not, but he's also not terrible. He's, he's, he's a guy who's got a little bit of upside for what you're paying for him. Yeah. A.G. Epinesa has the biggest contract out of any of the guys who are there, kind of in that secondary conversation, mm-hmm. besides Rousseau and Miller. 
I wouldn't be shocked if you come into this and you see Casey Tuhill and Dwayne Smith getting a lot of run early in camp mm. because they're going to try to establish which one of these guys can back up AJ Epinesa on the other side of Greg Rousseau. Mm. And this is how we're going to operate. And I think that you're going to see Miller get not only eased into things, but I don't think you're going to see him running a lot of starter snaps. I wouldn't want it. Yeah. I think that you saw that, at least in camp. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe as you get through the preseason and into the regular season, like yeah, it changes a little bit. It changes. And maybe week one, this is all, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a thought of mine. And mm -hmm. week one, he is the starter taking 70% of the snaps at DE mm -hmm. because they don't trust Casey Tuhill and whoever the hell else shakes out in this battle. We don't have a lot of dynamic players. Mm -hmm. It's why everyone like talks about the fact that there is a late round draft pick who could come in here and make an impact. I did a phone breakdown of him last week. Yeah, there you go. So go check go check that out if you want to feel better nice. about it over at Disguise Coverage. Shameless plug. I'm I'm in lockstep with you. I think I think Rousseau is edge one. I think AJ and Vanessa from a snap share perspective is edge two. But even from a production standpoint, he had a really great year last yeah. year from an efficiency standpoint. My expectation for Von Miller is edge three maybe edge two type of production like yeah. at, at, in terms of like what i think the ceiling is or, or positivity but i think i really do think the top four i don't know how the snap counts will end up working out i do think it's going to be groot epinesa von miller i think smoot is a super underrated signing what he yeah. was before so he tore his achilles week 16 of 2022 last year was a work back year for him did an interview in like mid-november saying he just started to feel like he was in the type of game shape as if camp just ended, let alone wasn't even close to being like what he was pre-injury. You need a full year to come back to get close to a semblance of yourself before the Achilles tear. Well, wait, and, but but did he do what Von Miller did and go on a podcast and then talk about it and talk about how great he was no, and then get mad not. at everybody for bagging on him for it? No, he did not. No, he did not. <laughs> he's just, he, I really think he's going to be an underrated, and I, I've said it on the show, I don't think he's going to be the level of top tier sack production that Leonard Floyd was. But I think Smoot is the signing that when we're in the middle of October or first week of November, we're going back being like, man, Smoot might be of the Thank best God. move that they had this offseason. <laughs> Thank God this happened. He can – just what he can do off the edge as a spiker and in two-man games, he can reduce down inside in known passing situations and rush from the interior. And he fits their style. He is a physical pocket compression style of rusher with yes. size, length, and physicality. Does enough against the run. Isn't tremendous against the run, but does enough. I think he gives you enough variability in that top four. And then the fifth – Maybe it is – I don't know if they're going to keep five, but maybe it's Casey Tuchel or maybe they just go pure Javon Solomon because they like the bend and pure hunt mm -hmm. pass rush nature of it. I do think with his size and frame, it's going to present a little bit of a struggle or adjustment period for him at first. But I think the edge grouping is one to watch because I don't think I, – I like the depth that they have there. I think they have a bunch of dudes that can be like between a B minus and a B. I don't know if they really have anybody that's above a B plus. No. Like if it, in a – Groot as a run defender – is a plus like he is phenomenal as a pass rusher he's probably a b minus yeah maybe. on a good day yeah. if he's completely healthy maybe he can scratch like a b plus or a b to a b plus but i think overall as a player yeah. when you balance it out he's like a b plus or an a minus which is still fun but no one else i think comes into that i think epinesa at the end of this year could be in the b plus conversation so it's it's a hockey reference i'm cool if you have four lines and they're all like number. Your top three lines are all number two lines, and your fourth line is a number three. The Sabers had that after the lockout. Like they didn't. They had a number one line, and they rotated, but they didn't have a star-studded top six. But they had four lines that could all score and all do these like everything that you needed. I think the edge grouping can do that. They just don't have that top tier star. And if Groot is that, that's cool. But I also don't think that's great. So no. they think they have a lot of good functional depth from a high-end perspective, but not a lot of top tier. This guy can go get you a bucket and win. So camp is going to be fun to watch how this shakes out. And who knows, maybe Casey Tuhill surprises everybody. But the way his contract is structured and what he's getting paid versus what Dwayne Smoot's getting paid versus what... It's, Two Hills a grinder, great motor, defends the run. He's not going to give you a lot of pass or upside. He's Ryan Denny. I don't want to hear anything wow, about good it. good cop. <laughs> He's Ryan Denny. Guys, I'm calling my shot right now. Casey Tuhill equals Ryan Casey Denny. Casey Ryan Denny. I'm going to end the podcast with that hot take. Guys, make sure you go check out Disguise Coverage. He's going to have a lot more intelligent conversation than what you'll find here at the Rock Pile Report, but that's okay. That's not why you're here. You didn't come here to get smarter. You came here to have a laugh. Hopefully, you got a couple of them, and you, you at least kick around some of the ideas you heard us talk about tonight. 
The other thing I love outside of this is podcasts that run long. Chris is furious. I love it. Sorry. Guys, we got to get out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Kruger. That's Anthony Prohaska. And this has been your Rock Pile Report.